Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay with True North. Today my guest is Megan Murphy. Megan is a journalist and the founder and editor of Feminist Current. She speaks regularly to the public about women's rights and gender identity legislation. In 2017, she spoke to the Canadian Senate about Bill C-16, which enshrined gender identity into Canadian law. And recently she spoke in Scottish Parliament about gender identity legislation. So, hi Megan. Hey, thanks for having me on. So we first met, uh, I think it was about a year ago now, in October 2018. So I invited you to speak at Wilfrid Laurier University because I had, uh, while I was a graduate student, I had the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry. And I had a couple people recommend you as a speaker. And so I invited you, but Laurier um, decided they were going to charge, I think it was $8,055 in security fees, which is ridiculous. Um, and I remember I sent you an email and I said, I was becoming really demoralized because I was like, I, like, I can't get this $8,000. Um, and I sent you an email and I said, I think we need to call off this event. And then I remember you replied and you were like, I don't think we should do that. And I thought, okay, okay, we can't. And so I found another venue, I think that same night for significantly less money, still a little bit because of security fees. That is all to say you are controversial. Why is that? Uh, I've never been able to figure it out, really. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything controversial. <clears throat> I think that what is controversial is often based on hearsay more than what I actually say. But I mean, of course, in this situation, it's because I am one of the only people in Canada, particularly one of the only feminists in Canada, you know, who, who, who have been speaking out about this publicly. You know, I went to the Senate to testify against Bill C-16 because I felt that that legislation could harm women and girls. Um, and so how it's perceived by, you know, activists and by a lot of people on the left, I suppose, um, is that I'm opposed to trans rights or, you know, I don't want trans identified people to have rights and stuff like that, when really that's not the case. I mean, of course, I want everyone to have rights. Um, but I, I have concerns about how gender identity legislation impacts women and girls and we're sort of seeing these fears and these predictions that myself and other feminists have expressed come true. The, the case of uh, Jessica slash Jonathan Yaniv is a great example. I'll explain in case anyone in your audience isn't aware, although probably many of them are. Um, so Jonathan, who, who became Jessica not very long ago, you know, he was, he was going by the name Jonathan on social media in November when he had me banned from Twitter and then switched over to Jessica shortly thereafter, um, had gone around to some local estheticians here in the Vancouver area um, and requested a Brazilian bikini wax. And of course, he's male. So these estheticians not only were not trained to perform that service, you know, it's a different, it's a totally different thing. Um, you, I, I believe, I mean, I've never performed a Brazilian bikini wax myself and definitely not on a man. <laughs> but uh, it, I, I guess you need like a different kind of wax and you need a different kind of training and et cetera. And moreover, most of these women were working out of their homes and they didn't want to touch a man's genitals. They didn't want a naked man in their home alone with them, which should be totally reasonable. But because we're now living during a time where if a man says that he's a woman, we have to accept that, no questions asked. He was able to accuse these women, many of whom are immigrant women, um, many of whom English wasn't their first language. Um, and of course, these are not you know wealthy, powerful people. These are women who are working independently. And he was able to accuse them of transphobia and so dragged a whole bunch of these women to the BC Human Rights Tribunal claiming that he was discriminated against based on gender identity. Um, and, you know, this is, this is one example. There's also the, the, the reality that there are men being transferred to female prisons um, and there's sexual harassment and sexual assault happening as a result of that. Um, we're seeing men win 
sports competitions against women because they're competing as women based on their identification, their identity, I should say. Um, and, you know, we're seeing men have access to women's shelters and women having to leave because they feel unsafe or because they're actually accused of transphobia when they protest. Um, and, you know, this is exactly the purpose of, regardless of what people say the purpose is, the, the real purpose, or at least the real result of gender identity legislation is that any man at all can say he's a woman and we all have to accept it. And if we say no, we're guilty of discrimination. So you're just trying to say, let women have their spaces, let them have their, their prisons, their shelters, their sports, trans women or trans individuals, they, they can have their own separate spaces. Is that kind of to summarize really briefly your position? I mean, sure. Like if, I mean, to me, it's not really about trans people. It's really about males because I don't have any interest in keeping females who identify as trans out of women's spaces. Um, it's just that some women's spaces are for women and girls only because those spaces are spaces where women and girls might be particularly vulnerable. So it's appropriate for males not to be allowed to allowed access. And whether they identify as trans or not really doesn't matter to me. I mean, trans identity doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, it doesn't mean you've had surgery. It doesn't mean you're on hormones. Not that I necessarily think those things would change anything, but we would we could have that conversation if that were the case but it's purely based on self-declaration, right? Um, and yeah, I just, I, gender identity and sex cannot coexist. And because women's rights are sex-based, gender identity legislation inherently nullifies women's sex-based rights. You know, like either sex is uh, immutable, um, it's a material reality, you can't change it, or it's whatever anyone says it is and, and sex is based on your own desire or perception or identity. So there's this popular mantra, trans women are women. Um, so I, I would be more of the view that trans women are trans women. They're not women, but they're, they're trans women. Would you be more of the view like me that trans women are trans women or that trans women are men? Well, trans women are male. And I mean, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with saying that. And I don't really care how someone wants to identify in their personal life. You know, if, if a man wants to identify as transgender or as a trans woman, if he wants to change his name, if he wants to, you know, dress like a woman, whatever that means, um, that's fine. I, I don't care. But, you know, once you start creating legislation around those ideas, of course, that changes everything, which is why I started talking about it. But, you know, as I said, I mean, I, there's no what you know, what is a trans woman that what does that mean? Um, you know, what's the difference between a trans woman and a male? That's a question I, I asked often and one that I was punished by Twitter for asking. Actually, they forced me to delete a tweet asking, you know, and I wasn't trying to be antagonistic. I'm trying to I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to get somewhere with this. You know, I'm saying, okay, what is it that happens between male and trans woman? What changes there? You know, how are we defining a trans woman? So, yes, you're banned from Twitter still. What is it exactly that got you banned from Twitter? What were the problematic tweets here? Well, I, I, was, I was made to delete a bunch of tweets, um, but I wasn't banned for those tweets. They just, you know, locked my account and said, you have to delete these or you can't get back on. And I was like, didn't understand why I had to delete these tweets because they weren't hateful. But I was like, okay, whatever, I'll delete my tweets. And, um, you know, one of them was for saying men aren't women, which wasn't, I mean, people lie about this all the time and Twitter has lied about this actually. But I wasn't, that wasn't directed at any individual. I was in the middle of a conversation with somebody on Twitter who I don't know. I don't believe they were trans. I have no idea if they were. It was just an avatar, right? <laughs> like, and, you know, I said, but men aren't women in response to what we were talking about. I wasn't saying to any individual, you're a man, not a woman, or something like that. Um, and then in that conversation, I also asked, what's the difference between a man and a trans woman? Again, trying to get at this point that, you know, it's like, how are we defining these words? What does this mean? And so they locked down my account and made me delete those tweets. And then, of course, all this stuff happened or had begun to happen with Yaniv. Um, and 
somebody published a blog post revealing his identity and revealing that he'd behaved in predatorial ways towards girls and, you know, revealed that this was kind of his M.O. Like he would go around to businesses and kind of try to extort money out of them or, you know, free food or something like that by filing all these complaints or pretending he was treated badly or discriminated against, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, basically a scam artist. And so I tweeted the link to that post and said, is it true? You know, I was asking for confirmation if her information was correct. I was like, is it true that, you know, because he was being referred to only as JY in the media at that point, his, his uh, identity was being protected. Is it true that J JY is, and I linked to his uh, Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. And then it was confirmed. I received like a screenshot of a review that he'd posted on Yelp or something like that saying like, so-and-so did a great job on my bikini wax with his face there and his name there, Jonathan, not Jessica. And so I posted the screenshot and said, and this is all public. This was not hidden information or anything. Um, and I said, yeah, it's him. And so I was banned, I assume, for misgendering, which wasn't actually an official rule on Twitter at the time. They changed the rules later that evening after they banned me. <laughs> and it kind of quietly became a rule. Yeah, yeah, like they didn't announce it to users and the first report on the actual change came like half an hour after I was banned on Pink News, which I found rather mysterious. So what's interesting is I misgendered the same individual, um, Yaniv, and I, I called Yaniv a uh, fat, ugly man. I never received confirmation that that was why, but I was, suspended yeah uh, permanently after that but after a few people uh you know with their verified check mark spoke out and asked you know why am i banned i was actually brought back so it was a permanent suspension because i had had enough temporary suspensions um but they still they're very inconsistent right twitter this is the thing they're unaccountable and they're inconsistent why was i brought back within days but you brought it to court your ban and you lost, and now you're in the appeal process. Yeah, and I, I appealed the decision when it happened. Um, I, a whole bunch of people complained about it online. You know, like, it's not like they didn't get feedback about that. Um, I asked many times, I'm like, why was I banned? Like, what rule did I bro break? And I just got these like form answers saying you broke the rule against hateful conduct. And then, you know, this was the only tweet that they offered me as reason for my, my banning, right? And I was like, this isn't a hateful tweet. I wasn't attacking anyone. Um, he was using his male pronouns on Twitter at the time. Like, I don't know, it seems, I mean, yes, inconsistent and unaccountable is exactly right with regard to Twitter, but you know, it seems like they're just specifically punishing me or, and you know, Yaniv has taken credit for this banning. So it was his, his responsibility. So he, this guy who's a predatory guy who, um, you know, har harassed, tried to extort money out of, out of these women, um, you know, he's, he's not a good guy, right? And why does he have the power to have women silenced online in that way? And to me, you know, like, it's like, yeah, it might not seem like a big deal to get banned from Twitter, but for me, like, I'm an independent writer and journalist. Like, the only way that I have to, you know, I'm not working for any kind of institution or company. Like, this is a really important way for me to communicate with my audience. Um, it's a really important way to communicate and connect to other writers and editors sources things like that you know it's how people contact each other like it's harder to get in touch with people if you don't have access to twitter if they're just people that you don't know you know what i mean and beyond that like it's like the level of libel that happens to me online constantly that i'm not able to defend myself against and you know people say the most horrible untrue things about me and i can't say anything and it circulates and becomes truth um, so, you know, it does feel like it really does have a big impact on me and, and, you know, for Twitter to kind of choose to, to ban a woman for, for challenging somebody like Yaniv and for just challenging and questioning these ideas in, in not a hateful way and not in an antagonistic way, like in a serious way, you know, obviously I, I care about this issue and there's lots of people who care about this issue. It's not just me, you know 
being a provocateur or something like that. It just seems so out of line and and punitive and, and petty, to be honest. I mean, they just seem kind of petty at this point. They're like being stubborn about it or something like that. You had a speaking engagement very recently. I think it was October 29th. And there was a petition to not let you speak. So what's interesting about this petition I found is that it was written by three women. So it seems like it's women behind your deplatforming a lot of the time. Yeah, it's totally weird. I mean, so I talk a lot about, <clears throat> I mean, first, I guess I should, I, I, um, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that people are using the Twitter ban as, you know, evidence that I'm hateful because I feel like this Twitter ban had another impact also, which is essentially that, you know, it's almost like a form of libel, right? Like, so people are saying, well, she's so bad, she was banned from Twitter. I mean, first of all, which is a crazy thing for any progressive or leftist person to say as though some like multi-billion dollar corp corporation should determine which women get to speak and what kind of political speech or what kind of speech at all is acceptable. Um, and that they've essentially framed me as as so bad, you know, worse than any of these other, you know, misogynists and racists and trolls and, you know, worse than all these people who've sent me violent threats and death threats and rape threats on Twitter. I'm worse than all of them for saying, or, you know, for calling a man he. Um, but yeah, like, so I talk a lot about trans activists and trans activism. And I want to clarify because people, you know, get confused that I'm not necessarily talking about trans identified people, you know, like trans identified people are not a monolith. I don't think that all trans identified people agree with this kind of activism and these efforts to, you know, platform and, and the threats and the harassment and the intimidation and stuff. But um, I, you know, I mean, activists who advocate gender identity ideology and advocate for gender identity legislation. But yeah, it's like the the fact that it's so many women who are on board with this and participating in the no platforming and the bullying and the harassment um, is really kind of baffling because it's like they're working against themselves. You know, it's like I'm fighting for women's rights, women's rights that women fought really hard over a century to to gain and that are now being um, rolled back and disappeared because of this trend and this this really kind of irrational ideology and I think a lot of it is probably virtue signaling like that's so big in in the progressive movement and on the left um, you sort of like to announce your perfect politics to everyone so you can get a lot of likes um, I think there's a lot of cowardice on the left these days uh, particularly in Canada, um, where people don't want to stand up to their friends. They don't want to piss their friends off. They're afraid of being ostracized and, you know, kicked out of their political groups or their activist groups or their political parties or their unions or whatever, um, because that really does happen. I mean, there's a, such a cult mentality um, in these spaces right now where if you don't toe the party line, you're you're kind of kicked out and banned and ostracized and I and you know that can be really hard like it's hard to to lose your community or to lose your friends it's certainly hard to lose your job um but at the same time I mean I don't think I could live with myself if I went along with lies especially lies that I felt were harmful just to kind of keep my friends right so with your um Toronto Public Library talk can you there, I think there was a protest of 500 people, is that right? I'm not sure the numbers, but yeah, I mean, it was hundreds of people. Like some, the cops said 700, but I don't know if it was that many. That sounds like a bit much to me. So yeah, probably like, I don't know, anywhere from three to 500 people. There were a lot of people out there <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and I think one of the people who was instrumental in actually making this event happen was Vickery Bowles, who's the chief librarian. Um, of the Toronto Public Library. I don't know if it was just that branch or the libraries in general. The library. She, yeah, she's the uh, city librarian for Toronto Public Library. So I, I believe that's for all of the, the Toronto Public Libraries. And, and she was sticking up for your, your speech. Um, so you were invited by a group called Radical Feminists Unite. Um, to come speak at the library and you know I'm sure you expect it by now that there are all these calls to have you deplatformed and you're not allowed to speak here um, but this librarian was very 
public about her stance that this event should happen. I'm not going to back down. Um, if Megan Murphy was, you know, violating the criminal code of hate speech, she would have been prosecuted already, and she hasn't. And I thought that was a great line. I read that in a, in a CBC uh, interview with Vickery Bulls. And I think if, if you had a more cowardly librarian, I'm not sure your talk would have happened in Toronto. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, and a lot of people were really proud of what she said and that she stood up in the face of such bullying and said, no, the library exists to have these kinds of conversations conversations the library's mandate is to support and protect free speech and free expression and i'm going to die on this hill that's what she said like it's so great and you know she said we determined that megan isn't and this group isn't promoting hate or hate speech um and you know people online called her a fascist like which is the most ironic thing i've ever heard because these people are the ones behaving like fascists but yeah, I mean, certainly if it was somebody who was more cowardly or who, you know, again, cared more about likability than doing what was right, then maybe we would have lost that venue. Yeah. And what I'm worried about is people from, you know, maybe my generation, let's say, uh, growing into those roles as, you know, a chief librarian um, when the next generation moves in who are kind of accustomed to oh, it's okay to not let this person speak. Who cares about free speech? If I don't like it, um, I can kick it out of the public sphere. Like, I have the power to do that. I'm, I'm worried about those people coming into positions of power, frankly. I know. I mean, they really, they don't value really important human rights. I mean, they're talking about human rights, but they don't really seem to understand or value rights that are really um, foundational to a free and democratic society. And it worries me too. I mean, these people spend so much time online that it seems like, and you know, not reading books and they don't seem to understand history. So that's a big part of the reason that they don't understand the importance of these ideas and these rights. Um, they just sort of see what their friends say online. I think, you know, in Canada, there's a lot of like privileged, pretty entitled people who don't seem to realize that in other countries, they don't have free speech. And that's a really horrible, scary thing where people can be jailed and murdered for having the wrong political opinion, for speaking out against those in power. Um, and in Canada, people seem to be like, whatever, yeah, free speech is for me, but not for you. Um, free speech is fine so long as, you know, I agree with it, which is, of course, not how free speech works. And anything notable the protest in, in Toronto? Was there any, were there any arrests? <laughs> I don't think there were any arrests. I mean, I saw some of the footage online and I frankly found the protesters quite scary. Um, they were so full of rage and had no idea what they were mad about. You know, like the things that they were saying about me and the things that they were saying I believed and was doing. I mean, it was just, it had no relation to anything I actually say or believe. And they were screaming at attendees. People were like calling them like, misogynist names that I won't say out loud here, but you know, like they were saying really horrible things and being really intimidating and screaming like shame, shame at these people as they're leaving. And these are all just regular people. Most of the audience was women. Most of the audience were just like feminist women. Um, and they were just being horrible. And you know, I'm really impressed by the people who showed up because they had to walk through this crowd of hundreds of people screaming at them and bullying them and intimidating them just to come and support this conversation. And I know that it was scary because I talked to women after and they said it was really scary. You know, like I was taken out the back door. I had to have police escorts and bodyguards and they blocked off the back road with cop cars so that I could get in and out of the building safely. It's just insane. All right, let's move on to the November 2nd event. Um, the panel that featured yourself, Jonathan Kay, who's the Canadian editor of Quillette, and Anna Slats, who's a writer with the Post Millennial. And I was the moderator. Um, so this was supposed to take place at SFU. Had you been coordinating this for a while with the organizer who invited you? Yeah, um, 
I'm Ugh. trying to remember when we started working on this, but you know, it had been months and months and months. It's been a long time. You know, you have to plan these things pretty far in advance if you want a venue. Because we did the room booking through a professor at SFU, <clears throat> Mark Collard, it was his name on the booking. And so at the last minute, two days before the event, he got cold feet. Security had said they were worried about violence, but of course, you know, there's always threats of violence at our events. That's why we have so much security. All the events have been great. There's not been any violence. There's not been disruptions. It's been fine. The protesters stay outside. The attendees are safe. Um, but in any case, he pulled out and we were kind of screwed because we couldn't you know, there's nothing we could do to negotiate with, us, with SFU from a legal standpoint at that point. And, you know, it wasn't our name on the booking. So, you know, we had to unfortunately scramble to, you know, call all these venues in Vancouver. Um, most things are booked on a Saturday night with two days notice, but we did eventually get a room at the Pan Pacific, which was awesome because it was a really beautiful room and the Pan Pacific was awesome and the security was great and they totally helped us out. And um, it turned out to be a really wonderful event and it was a bigger venue. So we were able to open up tickets. You know, it had been sold out for quite a while and all these people were asking about tickets. So we were able to accommodate those people. So I remember um, someone in the audience yelled out so Jonathan Kay was speaking and you and him were having like a bit of a back and forth I suppose I think this was at that moment where I guess he was more you know we have to use pronouns we have to be respectful let's take the high road um, and I think someone in the audience yelled out to him we want to hear women speak um, and that was a moment for me where I kind of thought maybe feminism is Kind of hostile to men and i i kind of cut, had like a bit of a jolt there where i was like i don't know if it was like fair to do that um do you get a lot of pushback on being a feminist i don't really get a lot of pushback on being a feminist i don't really think it's very controversial to be a feminist nowadays um i mean it's sort of trendy right so i guess where where do you differ from maybe mainstream feminism oh definitely... like my kind of feminism yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so like the popular version of feminism nowadays <clears throat> is third wave feminism, uh, which I don't ascribe to. You know, my my feminist beliefs include or arguments include, you know, a critique of pornography and the sex industry, violence against women. And of course, now this gender identity ideology. Um, I don't really ascribe to the kind of feminism that is like anything a woman do does is a feminist thing and is inherently powerful or empowered and like if they choose it and any choice a woman makes should be applauded and validated and I think that's all a bit silly. Um, and you know third wave feminism has really embraced pornography and embraced prostitution and embraced objectification and um, all these things that women in the feminist movement have challenged for a really long time. And beyond that, they also seem to have decided that they want to trash all their foremothers. So they trash the suffragettes, they trash first wave feminists, they trash second wave feminists, they trash radical feminists. Um, in what ways do they trash them? Um, well, they accuse them of being kind of prudish, like anti-sex. Um, they refer to them as white feminists, despite the fact that, of course, the feminist movement is diverse. Um, and, you know, the pearl clutchers, things like that. Um, of course, now they, they accuse us of being transphobic. They use words like whorephobic, which is ridiculous because there are lots and lots of women in the feminist movement who have been in prostitution themselves. You know, there's lots of women that are my friends and women that I've worked with for years who've been in prostitution. You know, having a critique of sexual exploitation is not having a critique of women who have been prostituted. It's the opposite. <laughs> so those are some ways that I differ from, from those women. Um, I mean, yeah, feminism is such a confused term these days. People seem to think it is whatever they say it is or, you know, think it means all sorts of things. And so it's not, it's sort of almost become not that useful of a term, sadly, because, 
you know, I would rather at this point, rather than just say a feminist and then let people make a bunch of assumptions about what that means, I'd rather just explain what my views and my arguments are. And that offers me more freedom too. Like I've sort of become, I always did identify as a feminist and a socialist. Um, and you know, most of that is probably true if you've asked me about my particular beliefs around things like, you know, healthcare and housing and women's rights and universal daycare and uh, public education and all of those things. But I don't want to be limited by labels or ideologies. So you said women's rights. I was, it seems to me that now women's rights, when people use it, when politicians use it, it kind of just seems to refer to abortion. Is there really anything else to women's rights when we use it now? Well, so for example, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, women's rights can mean all sorts of things, but of course, like at one point, women weren't allowed to vote and women had to fight for the right to vote. And the reason that they weren't allowed to vote in part was because they weren't considered people. So once women married, they became their husbands politically, essentially, and they couldn't own property. And so they basically couldn't kind of exist independently. Um, so but when we use it today, are we talking more about just the maintenance about those already won? To ensure that women are discriminated based on discriminated against based on sex. So in the workplace, for example, so that women can't get fired for getting pregnant or get fired or because they might get pregnant, which is something that used to happen a lot. And I think still does happen sometimes, to be honest. But, you know, that happened a lot pre second wave feminism. Um, you know, in Canada. Uh, female firefighters had to had to fight to have their own locker rooms because this was a, an industry that was long dominated by men, of course. So there was only men's locker rooms and women had to use those and they were getting sexually harassed and sexually assaulted in those spaces. So they only recently kind of won the right to have their own spaces in these places. Um, you know, women having access to women and girls in high school having access to female only sports teams. That's a right that, you know, feminists fought for so that women could compete on fair ground. And that's a right we see uh, being taken away. We, we mentioned at the start with women's sports. Um, I'm sure you you're well versed in the case of Rachel McKinnon, mm -hmm. who competes in masters cycling races. So Rachel is a trans woman who competes in the women's races and breaks world records. Um, so I guess that's the kind of thing that you're saying maybe shouldn't be happening. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, again, this is it's so strange even to have this conversation because, you know, it's weird to have to say male and female bodies are different. They are. Uh, you can't change a male male body into a female body. Um, even if you dec decrease testosterone, which is what they're saying in all these, you know, sports organizations or whatever. It's like, well, if a man identifies as trans and reduces his testosterone, then he can he can compete fairly against women. And that's not true. I mean, he's still developed as a man and men have more muscle mass. They're generally taller. They have longer limbs. They have bigger organs. I mean, and there's all sorts of other ways that male bodies are different than female bodies. Of course, if you understand how reproduction works, then you would understand that also. Um, and it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just a total joke that a man can say, I'm a woman and compete against women in, you know, track or whatever and win and be setting. Well, these are men who would be, you know, mediocre athletes if they were competing against men. But, you know, what a great loophole. So you've mentioned that the leftists and progressives, they are not on board with your opinions generally, with your arguments, but I think generally conservatives are. And I think maybe you found yourself in an alliance with, with conservatives on this particular issue. Um, would you say that that's fair? Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't consider it an alliance per se. I just consider it like, of course, there's things that I you know, a variety of people agree with me on and that I agree with them on and then we disagree on, uh, on about other things. You know, this is why I really have stopped finding these political labels and left versus right and conservative and left wing or whatever, not very helpful at all because I don't think it's applicable to most people. I think most people don't identify as left wing or right wing. They're just regular people who believe various things. Well, what I was wondering is if you have, I think you have a largely 
feminist base um, that follows your work. I mean, your, your podcast and, and website is called Feminist Current. Um, so is your base giving you any flack, I suppose, for um, engaging with, you know, the, the evil conservatives? I, I mean, some people have, yeah. Some people have said, you know, like, it's not a good look or that it like taints me somehow or it taints the feminist movement because I talk to people, you know, they don't like. And a lot of people that I'm criticized for talking to aren't even right wing people. They're like liberals or libertarians or, you know, I don't even know what they would describe themselves as. They're just people who aren't squarely on the left or necessarily feminist or they don't agree with everything that feminists say or something like that. Um, I mean, people need to employ a lot more nuance when engaging with people's ideas than they do. But yeah, but I, I mean, at the same time, I have a lot of support and people, I mean, my role as a writer and a journalist and a speaker is to talk to people. So I will talk to almost anyone, you know, like I'm not doing, um, I'm not only doing, you know, political organizing. It's not just about like, and I, you know, I really, I, either way, I don't want to just talk to people who agree with me. That's boring. Yeah. I want to talk to people who are different than me, who have different opinions than me. I want my ideas to be challenged so that my ideas are stronger and my arguments are stronger. You know, like that's a useful way to ensure that you have good arguments is to challenge your own arguments and be challenged. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't like that kind of cultishness where it's like you can only talk to people who, or stand next to people or engage with people who already agree with you. I don't think that's helpful. I don't think it's particularly interesting. And I think it limits us in terms of our reach, you know, like I want these ideas to be out there. That's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to explain to people why I'm troubled by what's going on. And um, I want as many people as possible to support me and to support those of us who are who are fighting this. I don't really, care you know <laughs> like if they if they're if they're different than me I mean I'm still me <laughs> regardless of who I talk to um and if we happen to like each other or agree with each other, I mean I like lots of people like I really I enjoy talking to people it's not you know it's something that I like to do it's a way that I like learn about the world and it's a way to build empathy towards other humans which I think is really important and really lacking today so and I just I think more people would do that so I feel like people who are you know, would criticize me for doing that, should try to do it themselves, then they might find themselves surprised about how much they like people they think that they hate. Amen to that. <laughs> so what's next for you? Uh, I'm headed to New Zealand on Monday <laughs> to do, yeah, I'm stoked. Uh, I've never been there before, to do a couple of talks. Um, I don't know what's planned for 2020, but probably more talking, <laughs> more speaking about this. Um, trying to keep myself safe. I mean, things are getting a bit crazy. I, I have been doing a lot of media lately, so that's it's been stressful and pretty exhausting for the past few months, the past year in general, but particularly the past few months. I mean, all the protests and attacks are hard to deal with. Uh, I'm gonna keep at it and uh, I, I think the tides are turning, so I'm at least glad that we're having this conversation finally in Canada, that it's happening and people are pushing back and people are talking about it and people are showing up. I feel like it is getting a little easier to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we can't find you on Twitter, at least not yet, um, but you have a YouTube channel. It's just under Megan Murphy, right? Your right. Name? Yeah. Any, anywhere else we can find you? I have a Facebook page. I have a public Instagram page, unfortunately. I didn't used to have a public Facebook or Instagram page before I got banned from Twitter because I don't want to spend all my time on social media, but, you know, I do. And, and that's a place where you can find me and find my work and engage with me and I'm there. And of course, your website, Feminist Current. And you can find us at tnc.news on YouTube, on Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks so much, guys. And thanks, Megan, for joining me. Thanks. Bye.